Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another story in the life of the old time rock and roller. This segment is called Hollywood Auditions. It's about some pretty big auditions I had. I won't make it with you. Now, do you remember a band called Bread? In the 70s, their breakout album was number one. David Gates. So David was thinking of starting a side project and he wanted a guitar player and a drummer. He heard about Ty Grimes and Ty called me and we went out for the audition. We got to his house and it was a beautiful place, man, overlooking the Hollywood Hills. He said, you guys go out and set up in the pool room, meaning the swimming pool clubhouse. And we said, okay. And he said, and I'll be right out. And I, it, you know, once you're set up. So this was a chance of a lifetime to be in a side project with David Gates. Are you kidding me? So his wife was pregnant and he came out to the pool room. We, we, we were tuned up. We started to hit the first note, intercom blast. What is it? Honey, my water just broke. He said, guys, I'm sorry, I gotta go. My wife's water broke, we gotta go to the hospital. So off they zip, he, they, he said, just pack up and you know, shut the door when you're, when you're done. So that was one we never found out if we got it or not. I guess we didn't because we didn't make a follow-up album, but I think that his new child consumed you know, all of his time. Another audition I went on was for Captain Beefheart. And two of the songs I know I had to bone up on were Green Eyed Beans from Venus. It was all you green eyed beans from Venus. Don't let anything come in between us. Mr. G Horn Rolo, play that saxophone and let that long leaning note roll. So when I got there, there was a, a music stand that was about a yard long. And there was a score that was about six feet long. And I looked at it and I said, what the fuck? Pardon my French, but I said, you know, I can read a little bit of music, but this is a freaking score. Sorry. I'm out of here. So that one went bit bit the dust. If I, could only be sure that I had a bass player friend named Don who told me about an R&B artist named Nolan Porter. Nolan had a couple of hits called Love Won't Let Me Wait and How Can I Be Sure. They were romantic R&B ballads and really nice songs. So I learned them and then went out to audition. Nolan was playing Sunday nights at the Majestic Club in Watts. It was a very dangerous area and the gig went late into the night. So the waitresses would sell meth tabs or mini whites to the band members. I played for Nolan. He loved my playing and gave me the job. So for about three months on Sunday nights, I'd ride out to Watts and perform with Nolan Porter at the Majestic Club. It was a great gig, very low pressure. Nolan was a great guy and he continues to perform to this day with his wife. Thanks for the call, Don. Love me like you used to love me. Another interview I heard about, Ty Grimes was also on the interview. It was for the country singer, Tanya Tucker. And she was looking for a band for the road, for to go out on a three month tour. So we got there and set up and there was a TV show in the 70s called Barney Miller. And there was an Oriental guy named Jack Sue, who was one of the detectives on the show. Well, his son Rick was a bass player. I think they were Filipino and he played really good funky bass. Ty's a rock drummer, me the rock funk player. And we were all, and somebody else 
and we're auditioning for Tanya Tucker, the country singer. Do you think we got the gig? No, no, we didn't. <laughs> I didn't even wear a cowboy hat. But if I had, we still wouldn't have gotten the job. Oh yeah, here we go again. In the latter days of Hart's popularity, they were looking for a guitar player. My old road manager, Al Bradley, helped me load my Marshall into the car and all my gear. We played all of their hits, Barracuda, Magic Man, Crazy on You. And when I was through, Al said, man, there is no way you didn't get this gig. Well, I didn't get the gig. That's the way it goes. But it was another tremendous experience. And we always have to continue our pursuit on different paths, up the mountain, to the top, where we're all trying to go. And that was the hard audition. I found out that Poison was looking for a guitar player. C.C. DeVille was leaving the band. And I liked their song, Every Rose Has a Thorn. I wasn't a tremendous fan of the band. I kind of thought they were what we used to call posers. You know, just a lot of hair and pretty boys and standing around and not really playing great, but a lot of production that made it decent. Well, this was a different kind of audition because they just wanted you to mail in tracks of you performing. I sent in four really good videotapes of me playing and I never heard back from the management company because the band decided to get back together. So it was a false alarm, basically. Like Eddie Kendrick said, you just got to keep on trucking, baby. Chez le bon temps, roulez. Let the good times roll. Because you got to go through it to get to it, as Larry Graham said. My buddy, Peter Glendeman, called me from Las Vegas. And he said, I'm here with Wayne Cochran and the CC Riders. I've told them all about you and he's willing to offer you a tour of Saudi Arabia. I said, all right, put him on the phone. So he says, hey, yeah, it's Wayne Cochran. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we're playing Saudi Arabia. I said, well, wh how long? He says, it's, it's just a three week tour. I said, well, that sounds fine. He said, what? I said, what? how much does it pay? He said, it's two twenty-five dollars a week and you pay all your expenses. I said, what? Are you kidding me? I said, yeah, I'd love to go to Saudi Arabia, but not for 225 bucks on a bus riding through a desert looking at camels. And it's probably a good thing I didn't go because with the protocol with women and everything, I probably would have gotten in trouble. I got a call for an audition for a piano player with sort of classical rock Americana roots. She was from Oakland. She wrote her first song when she was 12 years old for a merit badge in the Girl Scouts. Her name was Holly Pentfield, and she had moved down to L.A. in the mid-70s. So she was looking for a band, and on this audition was the bass player from the Raves. Now, one of my very early videos about meeting Jimi Hendrix in 1965, the Raves were opening up for Jimi Hendrix. So I had seen this guy in 65, and now I'm auditioning with him. On the drums was the drummer for the Bobby Fuller Four. They had a, a top 40 hit called I Fought the Law and the Law Won that I played in high school. So I was very familiar with it. Holly had a manager that might have been her boyfriend, and we played through her material and I actually got a call back for a second audition. But we, she was a beautiful blonde, and we were kind of almost sort of 
flirting with each other. I went back for the second audition and played well, but the boyfriend manager handler, I think, picked up on this or whatever. Maybe Holly just decided I wasn't the right guy. Either way, I didn't get that job. So I think she recorded five of her own albums, had one song in the top 100, and then she moved to London where she became a top cabaret performer. She's still there today, performing and singing the cabaret and also singing her original material at other venues. It's amazing when you find these people that you knew 45 years ago. Another audition I went on that I got the job was for a drummer named Mark David Decker. This guy had the biggest drum set I had ever seen. It made John Bonham's drum kit look like a, a Tonka toy. And all of his songs were, of course, written around drum rhythms. We rehearsed a couple of months. I learned 12 songs. I think we recorded them. Nothing ever happened. There was no money, and I left that situation. Now, when Terry and I had moved to King's Road, Mark Levine, our bass player friend, was our roommate, and he lived across the hall from me. We both heard about an audition for Rolls Royce, who had the car wash song out, which led to the movie. So this was an audition for a bass player and a drummer. Well, at the last rehearsal for The Force, Bobby Zinner blew a fuse on his 50-watt Marshall. And I always carried one spare fuse, just in case. And I gave it to Bobby. So we're set up, we're with this band, we start off, and on the first E9 chord, my amp popped and it blew a fuse. I went to my kit, opened up the thing, it was gone. I said, oh no, I lent it to Bobby. Well, there was a guy standing in the wings who was the next guitar player up with the next crew, and his name was Paul Sabu. His dad was Sabu the Elephant Boy. When I was a kid, it was a jungle show. I used to watch it on TV all the time. So Paul had on, I think, white fur boots and a white Stratocaster and a, a gold vest and, a, you know, gold Indian arm bracelets or something. He looked like a, a million bucks, honestly. And he got up and played with Mark Levine, my roommate, and they both got the job. So that was just rotten freaking luck. And that was it for the auditions. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. So I hope you enjoyed it. It's a little bit, you know, where do you fit something like this in, right? So I said, let me just tell a little story of each one to let you know that no matter how many times you get kicked off the horse, you just got to get back up and try it again. So keep on trying, my friends. Keep the love in your heart and the song in your head. And I will see you down the musical highway on the next adventure of the old time rock and roller. So long, my friends. <laughs>